Hi everyone, welcome again to another Come Let Us Reason Together. This week we're going to be focusing on the family, or rather, how the family continues to diminish in our society. What is it about the birth rates today that we're seeing rapidly shrinking? Is this something to be concerned about? How will it affect our culture? And what does it mean for our future and our children's future? as we see birth rates plummet and the next generation continually start to shy away from the idea of having children and growing families. I'm going to be interviewing an expert in this, uh, Tim Carney, and I hope you'll enjoy our talk on this Come Let Us Reason Together. Okay, everyone, welcome again, as I said, to another Come Let Us Reason Together. This is going to be a great show today. Uh, it's something that's been bothering me actually for some time as I've been uh, starting to see different articles and different features talking about the family and how children are becoming kind of more and more rare in our society. We don't seem to be replenishing ourselves as we have in prior generations. And what I've done today is I've invited a special guest uh, with me in order to talk about this, an expert who's been studying these things, Tim Carney. And Tim is uh, a fellow at the American uh, Enterprise Institute. He's been uh, a columnist, author, and editor in Washington, D.C. Uh, his articles have been published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, as well as uh, he's appeared on Fox, MSNBC, CNN, PBS, and CNBC. Now, he's written a couple of books. Uh, the Big Ripoff won the Templeton Enterprise Award in 2008 for the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, but more importantly and more focused on this day's discussion is his upcoming book, Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be. Welcome, Tim. Glad to have you with me today. Thank you very much for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, I wanted to uh, find a couple of things out. First of all, um, you're a, a guy who's been really busy. You have six kids of your own. So uh, That's right. you, you, you know kind of from what you speak. Can you uh, tell me what, what kind of prompted you to get into this kind of research? So I had uh, written a book a few years back in 2019 called Alienated America that was about the collapse of local communities, sort of the update of bowling alone with more uh, look at religious institutions and how it intersects with our politics. And the political impact of the collapsed communities was really interesting. But what I thought was the most profound impact was the reduction in marriage and the falling birth rate. And then after that, uh, the number of babies born in America kept going down. The, the birth rate per woman kept going down. We had COVID, which drove it through the floor, and it didn't quite rebound. It basically got back on its downward trajectory. And so I thought, if so many people are choosing not to start families, and so many families are smaller, to me, that reflected that something was wrong with our culture. Some people say, oh, it's too unaffordable. I, I crunched the numbers. That didn't work out. Some people say, oh, it's just that people are selfish today. My belief is that people have been selfish since Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit and that things haven't really changed. What's wrong is that our culture uh, needs to support children and parents. And right now it's it's not doing that. And so I wanted to explore from my own experience as a parent, from the reporting I do going around the country and from digging into the social science research, what could be the causes, what could be the effects of this baby bus and ideally what could be the solutions. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff we got to talk about here. Um, I, I am concerned uh, in some aspects as to how uh, it's being positioned, even with those who are uh, talking about not having children. There are a couple of uh, prior articles that uh, I had mentioned. One was in Vox, uh, by uh, written by Rachel Cohen, and, and there's another one. Um, by uh, Cyan Chan, I believe her name was. Both of them were millennial women. Both of them were pulling away from the idea of having children. Both of them used many of those 
points that you just brought up. They talked about how a it's it's really hard. It's really unaffordable these days. Uh, there's there's an assumption that you have to kind of have everything together and have a line item in your budget for family before you even start family. There was also um, and, and maybe we should maybe we should unpack these one at a time a little bit more. So um, do you think? While things have kind of gotten more expensive, and again, when when I've talked about this in the past, this is how people have pushed back on me. Why do you think that the financial impact isn't as uh, as big a deal as maybe folks are making it? Yeah, so it, it does matter. And very specifically, in the last three years, the price of homes has gone up. Uh, while interest rates have gone up. And so buying a house is less affordable. That will delay marriage and family formation. But the baby bus has been going on since 2007. Starting in 2008, the number of babies born each year has been going down. There were fewer babies born in 2019 when we had the best economy we have had in our lifetimes than there had been during the Great Recession. So there's lots of reasons to think it's not just about economics. Richer countries have fewer babies than poorer countries. In America, if you break us down into deciles or quintiles, the richest 10% versus the middle versus the poorest, you steadily get fewer babies as people get wealthier. Hmm. And a lot of the economists who look at this and say, are millennials really poorer than Gen X or than baby boomers? The answer is basically no. At the same age, you know, the millennial, uh, the 35-year-old millennial has the same wealth on average as a 35-year-old Gen Xer, but my generation, Generation X, had more babies than the millennials. Yeah. So money, money matters, but it really, it's hard to say that it tells the whole story when you look at all that data. Yeah, I tell people, you know, hey, they had babies in the Depression. <laughs> and, and, and they definitely had it harder financially than we do today. So... But no, and I, I looked at old uh, demographic data, and the depression actually saw no dip in the birth rate. The twenties actually saw a significant drop in the birth rate. The Roaring Twenties, which goes to show that maybe there's something about culture in different eras in different places that influences it more. And that's why in Family Unfriendly, the, the subtitle says how our culture makes raising kids harder, because I believe that if the economics doesn't explain it and they don't, then you do have to move to culture. Yeah, uh, obviously what, what, and what this brings out is more affluent societies tend to prize things like um, recreation at a much higher rate and leisure at a much higher rate. And of course, having children cuts into both of those, which brings me to my second point that I was uh, noticing in these articles is there was this concern about well, it was twofold, some of which it was couched in the, well, I don't know that I would be a good mother. I don't know that I'm fit to be a parent. And this thing echoed over and over again. And my first reaction was, well, you know, you know how you get good at something? You practice. You do it. You know, nobody starts off being a major league baseball player. You start slow. But if you don't do it, you'll never get better at it. So it's, it's strange that something is natural as parenting, as, as, you know, being handed down from generation to generation would be resisted that way. But I'm, I'm kind of curious. It seems to me that in our society where you have a, a, a definitely a um, view of marriage that has changed, right? Marriage doesn't seem to be as permanent as it used to be. We grown up in an era of no-fault divorce, for example. And so there's this disconnect, and marriage has almost become uh, a contractual relationship. And I've heard even, yeah, they have divorce parties now. You know, divorce is something oh, that God. you can celebrate. And the idea, oh, if it doesn't work out, we can get divorced. However, if you're a parent, you can't just divorce your kids. And maybe that's something that's undergirding this, this, this commitment. I th that yeah, holds on. I, I think you said two very you've made two very important comments there. One is that you have the contractual notion of the, uh, of marriage, but two is that having a family just used to sort of be the natural 
thing to do. It, not everybody did it. That's the thing. Things can be sort of normal and natural, and we don't make everyone do it. And that's, in my mind, the traditional Western uh, Judeo-Christian, you know, Abrahamic idea of you finish school, you get a job, you get married, you have kids. If you want to choose something else, that's fine. And I'm, I'm a Catholic, and so we've always had avenues for people who aren't going to get married. That's what the priesthood or, you know, uh, brotherhood, sisterhood are all for. But the idea that it's just kind of natural has gone away. And so now it's an explicit choice. It's like a real big decision. It's, it's signing up for grad school or buying a house. Are you going to have kids? And then marriage, similarly, is a contract. We are in this because we have rationally concluded that we will both benefit from this. And if the mutual benefit ever ceases, we have an exit clause. Right. That's a big part of the problem. Because once people start to ch think of marriage and familyhood, not as a natural thing that you could opt out at, but as a very deliberate choice, at that point, you have the issue of, well, now it feels like it's so much more pressure. Like, you, you're not going to buy a house unless you're sure you have the down payment and can make the monthly payment, right? And so once you think, oh, well, I have to be totally ready for this, well, then it becomes a lot more daunting. Yeah. And that, I think, is part of the problem. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about one other um, resistant point point of resistance, I should say, uh, that uh, millennials have brought up, and that is the impact on the environment. This is another one that, they, and, and I, again, to me, when you're looking at these things, they feel, all, even when they're presented in writing, they feel like they're kind of excuses as to why we don't want to have kids. It's, it's, like, it's like you have this feeling, and now you're looking for justifications underneath it, right? And, and, what both of these women have said is, you know, how can we justify bringing uh, another individual into this world, especially twofold? First of all, uh, if climate change and our world is, you know, falling off of a shelf, how could I how can I bring a person into this world whose future is destined to be that poor? And secondly, I'm bringing another carbon producer um, a, another mm -hmm. footprint into the world. And, and of course, fewer people means fewer carbon means less impact on culture. Uh, what have you heard in, those, in that regard? So I definitely heard that from a lot of people. Interestingly, the sort of less political folks were more likely to talk about litter than about climate change. The people closer to New York and D.C. and politics just said, look, the planet's on fire. I don't want to bring kids into this burning planet. And I would feel I was, you know, contributing, I forget the amount, 52 billion tons of, of CO2 by making a whole other person. Um, and so I actually, I cite in there a, uh, a liberal columnist, Ezra Klein of, at the New York Times, where he told what itself is a sad story that people are constantly asking him, considering global warming, should I have kids? And like the fact that people ask that of their favorite columnist is a pretty sad commentary in itself. Uh, but more to the point, more interesting was his answer. He said, he wrote, I unequivocally reject. Now, remember, this is a liberal Ezra Klein, New York Times, totally believes in all of the uh, reasons to be worried about climate change. But he's, he quoted another Columbia University professor saying, I unequivocally reject scientifically and personally the notion that children are somehow doomed to an unhappy life. So that's part one, right? Mm -hmm. The planet is not on fire. Yeah. Uh, he quoted another person saying, you know, it, we, we think it's an apocalypse, but it'll just sort of be grim normality when the future comes. And so Ezra Klein's argument is that the people who are most afraid of this don't really have reason to be afraid of the planet burning what he thinks is going on. He says it's really that they feel guilty. That's the second part of your argument for uh, harming the planet. Mm -hmm. What they feel guilty for is living in a rich country and enjoying all this stuff that they think will harm the rest of the world. My argument goes a step further. I think that that climate guilt is just a totem of a deeper guilt. People who think we don't deserve what we have. People who think I don't really think we're good. And here you get into inevitably sort of anthropology, uh, 
faith, a view of humans in the world. Are we good? If we're not good, why are we allowed to exist? Right. Is it good that we exist? Yeah. If I don't achieve a lot in my life, am I just a net uh, drag on the planet? What if I fail at my ambition? All of that stuff, I think, is really underneath the climate change worries. It's really a deeper idea that uh, a lot of young people today, a lot of millennials, don't think of the human race as good. That's that's really interesting. That's and and we have to talk a, a lot more about that because that's part of my concern as well. And and also um, how we've we've kind of diminished children as accessories to a successful life. They're just kind of another showpiece mm -hmm. in that. And and I'll I want to get to that. But beforehand, I wanted to stop and and and, and note you you had talked about Ezra uh, Klein um, in. In, nine, in the 1970s, early 1970s, there was a very, very popular program called All in the Family. Uh, Norman Lear was the producer and the main showrunner. He um, was left of center, and he would use um, Archie Bunker, of course, as this consummate bigot, right, who was portrayed there. And, and yep. uh, Michael Stivick, his son-in-law, was the progressive young... Uh, revolutionary who would usually be the mouthpiece for Norman Lear's thoughts and feelings. And there was an episode in, uh, nine, nine, it was 1974, it was season six, episode one, where his wife becomes pregnant and he had, didn't want kids. And he used the same exact excuses in the early 70s, you know, we're polluting the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. What are we gonna do with the, the ozone hole and all this stuff? And it, what was fascinating was their next door neighbor cut out a quote from Alistair Cook. This is the early 1970s. Now, this is 50 years ago. And Cook's quote reads this, In the best of times, our days are numbered anyway. So it would be a crime against nature for any generation to take the world crisis so solemnly that it put off enjoying those things for which we were designed in the first place. The opportunity to do good work to enjoy friends, to fall in love, to hit a ball, and to bounce a baby. And in the episode, that actually changes his mind. That actually changes Mike Stivick's mind, which is, I think is fascinating. So here again is, a, is an example where this, this concept of, oh, the world is burning. Well, they were saying that 50 years ago. And Gee, Mr. Millennial, aren't you glad that they didn't stop having kids then because you wouldn't be here, you know? So it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting cycle that, that we see. But coming back to your other point, I think ultimately you've put your finger on something. Economics tells us that individuals will gather that which they feel is valuable. Right. If you if you put your value on money, you're going to get more money. Or if you collect old baseball cards, you're going to get more old baseball cards. And what concerned me more than anything else in seeing these trends is. Does it say something about our society where we are not trying to gather more children, more people, but mm -hmm. we're diminishing that? How do we understand humanity? How is our culture understanding humanity if we don't understand it through uh, generations what what do you yes and no in the preface of family and friendly i say this is ultimately a story of anthropology um that do you see humans as part of it is do you see humans as a good thing as i was saying earlier part of it is which of course redounds to do you see yourself as good I mean, you have to search inward if you think a mini version of me would be bad. Well, what does that say you think about your own existence? But setting that aside, the what we value increasingly in America is sort of total autonomy. And this is true in Western Europe as well. It's less true in some subcultures, but the, the idea, the sort of one unquestionable good in the elite philosophy the elite anthropology of the of europe and the u.s is that nobody else gets to tell you what to do mm -hmm. nobody else gets to change your course in life 
Well, what is marriage about? <laughs> right. Marriage is about surrendering a significant number of your decisions to somebody else. And that's why the idea of a permanent marriage, particularly like trading with somebody is great. That's totally consensual. As long as it's consensual, it's fine. But once you're in a permanent relationship, you lose some autonomy. You're surrendering some freedom anytime you enter into a permanent relationship. Well, nothing is more permanent than marriage. And then children in a different way uh, feel even more so that way, especially when they're totally dependent on you. To have somebody depend on you cuts against the sort of spirit of the age, which is that you give and receive only on a totally consensual basis. So I think what people value is I have my optionality, everything's consensual, and I have my total autonomy. That is all destroyed by kids in two ways. A, kids have a demand on your time that yeah. you're not allowed to negotiate away. And B, that they reflect back to you by being helpless when they're little and, and needing lots of help uh, for years and years after that. They reflect back to you that no human actually is autonomous. Right. Yeah. It, no I, man's I an use the Hillary Clinton quote all the time. I say it takes a village to raise a child. It, it makes us feel vulnerable when we realize, oh, this undertaking, <laughs> raising children, we really depend on neighbors and schools and, and pastors and friends and, and role models and babysitters. So that illusion of autonomy is uh, demolished mm -hmm. the second a child comes onto the picture. So, so let's take this from a little different tact. And I'm not sure if you touch on this at all in your book, but there's a theological aspect to this as well. Um, and we, you've, you've kind of brushed against it in a couple of ways. First of all, the idea of, of good and autonomous and things like that. Uh, if we see humanity as evil, just but evil in the sense that we're just another byproduct of a naturalistic world, um, then you can say, well, then it doesn't matter how many there are or, or if there are any, you know, at all in the future, who knows, another asteroid may come down and wipe out all of humanity and it's cockroaches turn to evolve, you know, that, that in a materialistic yeah. world, that's possible. If you're uh, taken from a Christian, Judeo-Christian understanding, then we bear God's image. And that has radical implications. Everything from stopping the infanticide that was common throughout the ancient world, uh, seeing children as image bearers, to providing equality for all people because we all share the same image of God and we all have that equal worth, but not necessarily dismissing the idea that there can be evil inside of us, that mm -hmm. we are not... Uh, perfect creatures were fallen creatures and therefore secondarily dependent upon God in order to understand our place in society. As we move further and further away from faith, again, you see these kinds of things grow. What, what has your experience been in that regard? So, first of all, just to add a, a kind of another way of looking at it, a term I used earlier was sort of a guilt in wealthy countries that we don't deserve what we have. To a Christian's ears, it's obvious we don't deserve what we have, yeah. right? And I'm not talking about a nice house or a yard or whatever, but uh, we all believe that sort of grace was something that was unearned and that it's impossible to deserve what we have. And that makes it a little easier. But if you think, oh, well, a lot of people, you know, have earned whatever they have mm -hmm. and they're and I haven't that adds to the sense of guilt setting aside that little amateur theology by me the sort of sociology is very clear that in the US one of the biggest predictors of uh, fecundity of fertility of having babies is religiosity specifically religious attendance and this is true for the Church of Latter-day Saints it's true for uh, Protestants it's true for Catholics it's true for Jews, it's true for Muslims. And that that really, what I spent a chapter in Family Unfriendly exploring is how and why. And with all sort of respect and apologies to any, any preachers out there, I don't think it's the homilies <laughs> that do it. I think it's the community. Yeah. And again, I'm a Catholic. I don't think it's just the, the catechism. I think it's the idea that you belong to a community that holds 
humanity as, as good in itself and that supports you and that thinks it's a really worthwhile undertaking and they're going to help out any parent who needs it and that says let the children come to me i think that that is why in across these different religions you do have a much higher birth rate and most importantly though might just be the idea of a hope for the future that if you just read the headlines and and uh you know study some social science you might be really grim about the future if you come at it from a supernatural perspective, you have some hope for the future. And I think having children is the greatest expression of hope for the future. So for all those reasons, yeah. it's totally unsurprising to me that more religious people, specifically people who attend a religious congregation of some sort, have a lot more children than people who don't. Well, there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's several things. Brad Wilcock has done a lot of really good uh, work uh, looking at this and showing how, um, the people who are most again devoutly religious and 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 attend services regularly are also actually the ones who rank the happiest overall uh, i it's interesting that we find ourselves in the midst of a of a crisis of depression nowadays at the same time everyone's trying to assert themselves but they uh, they seem to be um, not being able to find that thing that that uh, alleviates kind of that depression, that guilt. And you're, I think you're right that community is, is a big part of that. We forget how much we are a social animal and how much we need to be engaged and involved with other people. We also forget that really uh, not being self-serving but being other-serving is, is one of the fundamental aspects of understanding true uh, satisfaction and joy in life. I think that's a... And that's, and I, I call, um, so a lot of the book doesn't talk about the, the high sort of, you know, anthropology, theology we're, we're talking about. I talk about the lack of sidewalks and it's harder to let your kids okay. run around and the no, danger. And we're going to get to that. Sports. Yeah. Well, uh, but my, my point is I spend most of the book saying raising kids should be easier than it is. And then at the end I say, well, raising kids is always going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do mm. but it is the easiest road to a worthwhile destination yeah in other words I if like what that. you want is to be a person of virtue if what you want is to be a saint then there's no easier road than parenthood right. that jesus told us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and as a father of young children i wake up every day and there are hungry naked people in my house they're right there for me to feed and clothe. It's like handed to me on a platter. That idea that you're talking about a self-sacrifice for others. Marriage is the first time for most people that they actually act selflessly. Or at least for me it was. I'm sure there are better people who were selfless from the moment they were seven. But for me it was marriage. And then with children it becomes second nature. Um, just think of how, you know, you literally see parents throw their body in front of a kid to keep them from hitting their head on something yeah. or like, um, you know, when their children is, is bleeding or vomiting or something gross. If you saw a stranger on the subway, you'd really have to work up the will to do it. You see it as your child and you immediately run over there. Yeah. It, it becomes easier to do the right thing when you have, uh, when you have children, I call it a cheat code for virtue. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I remember we have so many stories of, you know, um, when you're newborn or eight month old, does that projectile vomiting thing at 2 a.m. and you still got to go do work the next day? Or, or I've always been amazed at how my wife will ask me to carry the 10 pound bag of groceries. But if a 35 pound child scrapes his knee, she can pick that kid up with one arm. And it's yeah. like, where did all the strength come from? When did you become the Hulk all of a sudden that you don't you don't care about how high how heavy the kid is, but you need me I help yep. to yeah. So it's it's exact it's exactly that. So uh, and before we get to kind of some of the 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 problems um, in terms of uh, the outworking of our culture and our and our society, uh, a couple other things that I do want to touch on. Um, as I said before, we're seeing uh, there, there's a sub movement where people really do see children as an accessory, a, a way to show that you are a successful mm. couple or a successful married thing. And and this is, of course, um, 
partially brought on by the fact that uh, our reproductive technologies have grown and we've started to see uh, surrogacy, for example, for same-sex couples. So one of the, one of the yeah. concepts of marriage is the, the, the process of marriage, what it does is it binds children to parents. That's originally the government recognized marriage because it links children to mothers and fathers. And if the father left, then how do we trace down the deadbeat dad? Well, we know that he was married to the mother and his name's on the birth certificate and therefore there's a responsibility there. But now that we've dis divorced the biology, so to speak, from it, where you can have a surrogate parent, a uh, sperm donor father, uh, you can have a lesbian couple who don't have a male figure, but they can still want to have babies or, or male homosexual couples, things like that. And then the inevitable aftermath is the court cases where um, there was one here in California where the uh, surrogate uh, had women and the contract called for a male child and they wouldn't accept the baby. So, so what do you do with the kid? You know, he becomes a ward of the state. Yep. Uh, things of that nature start to, start to show up, as well as the fact that you have um, individuals who are one gentleman uh, in the Atlantic and was, was covered where he found out not only was he, he knew he was a, a sperm donor baby. He didn't realize that he was one of 150 by the same sperm mm -hmm. donor. And he starts to feel, it goes like, I'm mass produced. I, am I, you know, it, so this idea of divorcing childbearing from family has huge implications on this society, yet it's deemed, again, contractual. It's deemed something that, that is, uh, it looks good because we're a married couple, now we have kids kind of thing. And it scares me to death that I work on a rarer generation that's going to really start to question who they are. We know that uh, sperm donor children have a drive at least as strong as adoptive children to find out who their natural parents are because they want to know how they fit in the world. And it's a big deal. So, But they, uh, what you're describing is a mindset that believes that, that nature can be overcome. Mm -hmm. I was watching one podcast about uh, women in work and how having children necessarily interrupts their ability to build their career part of my argument is that it should also interrupt father like good dads should be sacrificing yeah. work hours for their family but the these two women were saying well i just realized that if i try to build up my career for 20 years i've run out of time to have kids and so i have to interrupt my career early on when i need to build it up she just said i was raging against biology and i thought oh, that's so much of what the modern mindset is, yeah. is we want to overcome nature. And one of the arguments I make in Family Unfriendly is that this belief in chemistry conquering biology is, is uh, naturally, not, even when it's used for sort of uh, pro-natal, for, you know, mm -hmm. uh, IVF, et cetera, right, right. that this belief in chemistry conquering biology is always going to sort of go hand in hand with a, a less uh, pro-human, a less humane mindset. And it goes more hand in hand with the planning yeah. mindset. One line I have in the book is, no child was ever planned. <laughs> Somebody might have said, let's have a child, let's have this child now. And they do it and 10 months later they get their baby and it's still, we didn't get to choose a kid. Right. I describe in the book how the, we had named our daughter the moment we found out she was a, uh, it, she was a girl. We named her I is my mother's name, my grandmother's name. We had painted her, her nursery. We had even like found friends for her because uh, my wife's friends were also having babies. And then Lucy gets born and I look at her and I'm thinking, who is this person? She's a stranger. I've never met her before. How is this this person that I'm now stuck to for the rest yeah. of my life when she's a total stranger? And that idea that every baby is actually unplanned, that just shows that the planner mindset of today the autonomy, planning, uh, everything's consensual and contractual mindset is necessarily at odds with having kids, even when that you try to deploy those technologies and that mindset towards growing a family. Yeah, it's interesting when we, uh, I remember bringing home our first child, right? And, and, and of course, it's, it's, there's always a lot of stuff going on. You're busy, the birthing thing, and you've, you've got, you've kind of 
rehearsed that and you've done your Lamaze techniques and you've got the hospital bag ready and all of that stuff. But when you come home after it all, I remember we sat the baby <laughs> down and we looked at it and we looked at each other and said, they let us bring a whole person home. There's no instruction <laughs> manual. There's no, yep. yeah, there's, there's nothing. And, and now we have a whole person in front of us that we have to watch it. So it is interesting. And to, to your point where you talk about fathers, um, this is another interesting piece too. I don't know if you're familiar with Nancy Piercy, uh, but in her book, The Toxic War yep. on Masculinity, she makes the point that, uh, she says, the best time for the family was the 50s. But it's not the 1950s, it's the 1850s, because then okay. the father was at the farm, the children were helping with the farm. Dad was involved in every day of the child's growth and, and development. He was there, he was working. It was the industrialization of the world that really started to pull fathers away. And she points to that as how um, young men lost a, a, a proper understanding of masculinization and, and how to be um, uh, express oneself masculinely in the appropriate way. And she says that's where the slide started. Uh, of course, you know, we see things like the 60s where it accelerates. And like you say, you start to see uh, the, the whole feminist movement puts the emphasis not on mothering, but it puts the emphasis on career and success. And that's a big difference. And I've always wondered to me, it sounds like women just wanted to play on man's field using man's rules. It's like, well, why don't you flip the script? Why don't, you know, it, it's easy to go slip off someplace and work for somebody else nine to five and do whatever. That doesn't matter much in the world. What matters in the world is shaping the next generation. Women have the opportunity to shape and mold the next generation by being mothers. Isn't that the more valuable task? But our culture doesn't talk about it that way. It doesn't, it doesn't. No, that's exactly right. I, I talk, I don't use the phrase uh, systemic sexism, but I do talk about a, a concept that's like that, that a lot of times men in throughout history have had sort of the power to uh, shape the world and they ha haven't quite taken women and women's differences into account. And so we end up with this value system that values paid work career success, all of that stuff. And then for some reason, what feminism does in what most feminism in the 20th and 21st century in the US does is instead of challenging that value system, right, it goes and says, Okay, women can now be company men. <laughs> instead of saying, we're doing something more valuable, we should get the prestige for this, we should, you know, we have a tax code that basically discriminates against stay at home moms, we have a tax code that punishes uh, that that sort of thing. And uh, again, what, what as a society we honor is are the wrong things. And, and part of what I argue for, though, is that if that men, and this is happening, men are dads today spend more time with their kids than our parents did. Mm -hmm. That's positive, but it has to be done. But to some extent, that's just because guys are hanging out with their buddies less. I, I, I want a different trade. I want guys to hang out with their buddies again, but guys to at five o'clock stand up and say, okay, you know what? I got to go home to my family. Yeah. Because right now, if a woman leaves work at five o'clock, everybody says, oh, she probably has to run home to her family. I, I cite this one, um, research paper uh, where people at a firm said, oh, when a man leaves at five, I assume he has a meeting. When a woman leaves at five, I assume she's going home to her kids. Wow. And I thought, well, if that's what they're really doing, then the woman has chosen the better part. <laughs> really, the dads as bosses, as whatever, need to stand up and say, okay, I'm going. My family needs me. Help set the tone to make the workplace family friendly. That's the sort of feminism that I get behind rather than the women too can be uh, really successful in the corporate world. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so let, let's turn a corner here. Let's talk about how um, maybe culture helps reinforce some of these problems and, and what we can do, what are some ways we can kind of fix it? You, you had mentioned, for example, the tax code uh, as 
punitive towards homemakers. And, uh, you know, we homeschooled all four of our boys and uh, my wife has pretty much stayed home. She had, she worked through from the first two, but when we had number three, I said, oh, it's ridiculous. We're well, just going to work to pay a babysitter. Yep. It doesn't make sense anyway. And that's really what our goal was, was to have her home with the kids. So, so what, what specific uh, policies, uh, not there's governmental policies, there's economic policies, and then there's these social constructs, these social policies. Let's yep. take them one at a time. And, and, and why don't you tell me where you think things can be changed, what's going to be easy, what's going to be hard uh, in order to move the needle? Well, it's, it's good you're, you're talking about systems because some of what I talk about is individual choice that I hope the reader will read family and friendly and say, okay, you know what? We should parent a little different, but parents need support. They often fall into ha are sort of just dealing with the reality of the culture. And so systems do need to accommodate parents better. That said, I'm not a big believer in sort of what some European countries do is cut a massive check yeah. every year to parents or they subsidize daycare. I definitely don't support the subsidization of daycare because a you know if there's a poor single mother who needs it just do give her a check that can cover whether what she's going to choose to do and maybe subsidize work for a single mother it's really complicated and different once you start out with a child who doesn't have a father on the scene there's no such thing as a good answer either they're mm -hmm. not going to have a parent or plus you have, have the government now working. dictating what procedures protocols and and really moral yes. attributes that can be taught to those kids because it's all tied to money and so there's no no good answer there. But I would say in general, having a, uh, a child tax credit, uh, um, any money you're going to give to parents to support them should just be in the form of cash. If it's a ton of cash, there's a lot of reasons to think that that discourages marriage. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. that's not going to be good for the kids. So uh, what we currently have is a $2,000 tax per child tax credit that grows a little bit with inflation of, uh, under current legislation. Currently, it's not but hopefully soon it will. I support that. Make it a little bit bigger. Make sure kids get it until they're 18. Um, allow parents to move some of the money so it's, you know, maybe uh, 2,500 when they're younger and, and 1,500 when they're older, something like that. That's, uh, and then the social security system, um, it looks at how much you worked. It should value time spent as a stay-at-home mom mm. or stay-at-home dad as time worked. So if a woman graduates college, immediately gets married, is a stay-at-home mom, and then it's time to retire, she doesn't have any Social Security waiting for her. Mm -hmm. She has spousal benefits from her husband, but she should have earned her own by the homeschooling, stay-at-home momming, whatever else. And we know that stay-at-home moms have always been the biggest volunteers in society. So they, they definitely deserve credit for that. Um, I, I would support uh, changing the Social Security system to have... Uh, this was an idea that Senator Marco Rubio had, allow parents to take um, parental leave, maternity leave, paternity leave by sort of banking some of their Social Security retirement money early. So then they might have to work three, six months later on the on the far end at age 65, but they get to spend the time with the kids now. But that's the sort of tax policy. All of that is secondary, though, to really building a culture that is family friendly. And part of what I mean by that, a big part, is where kids can just run around. Yeah. <laughs> we want to spend time with our kids, but guess what? We also want them to go out and learn the world with their brothers, sisters, neighbors, cousins. I complain about the fact that where I live, very nice suburb in Northern Virginia, there's not sidewalks on our side of the street. Wow. Our kids have to run across the street just to w walk two doors down to the next door neighbor. A lot of places are built with massive roads. Uh, we replace downtowns that are walkable with a shopping center that's 10 miles away. Might be more convenient for doing a big shopping trip, but it's impossible for the kids to just walk down to the corner store and get a soda or a pack of gum or a pack of baseball cards, like a lot of us did. Uh, let your kids ride their bikes around wherever they want. We have a helicopter parenting culture where sometimes yeah, very much. The, the cops will bust you if you let your 10-year-old walk to the park with his you know, 11-year-old brother. So all of those things need to change. And then there's other things I talk about too. Travel sports, that's uh, sports or music or dance has to be super intensive rather than just a fun thing for kids to do mm -hmm. in the neighborhood with their friends. 
all of those things really add to the sort of mental and economic inputs that are expected from parents. They don't help kids either. They make kids more anxious, parents more exhausted, and they end up driving down the birth rate. So all of those are cultural changes that would make it easier for parents to make the right decision for their kids. In prior uh, generations, uh, and this is this may still be true in, in sub-segments of the Midwest and all, but uh, I'm in California, you're in Northern Virginia. It used to be that you, your folks would have a house. You may have been born there. You may have been born in the hospital down the street, but the house that you came home to was the house that they still live in and they will eventually die and your uh, brother, you know, or his brother would move three blocks away or two houses down. Or the, and Family was, was extended and could su- provide kind of some of that support in prior generations. And we are so distant and separate now. Again, some of this is, is chasing the, uh, the, the corporate dream, whatever the self ideology is of, of you know, yeah. I want to I want to get this thing for me, which means I have to move away kind of kind of deal. So so that's a big hole, I think, that a lot of folks are are feeling when they feel this kind of this loneliness or this this uh, poverty of community in, in regards to these things as well. Are you is this something else that's coming out of your research? Absolutely, absolutely. And when I talk about um, religious communities and the communities that are that are countercultural in that they are pro-child, that they're family mm-hmm. friendly, a lot of time that's the norm. That mom lives three doors down, um, and uh, neighbors that, will just uh, look after your kid, and that neighbors will yell at your kid if they do something wrong. That all those things. Yeah. All so those part things, of so why why young parents today today think raising kids is super expensive is because they think the only source of support support for parents parents is either the government or the marketplace. marketplace. That the the only only child care care they can get is something they paid for, unless they can get the government to take care of it, right? They don't think of neighborhoods because A, neighborhoods aren't as strong and tight-knit as they used to be. Again, the bowling alone, this is what I wrote about in Alienated America. But B, I think part of it is just that they don't see it, that it's it's not as natural to young people to think of the organic community as a source of serious support. And so that absolutely is one of the reasons it seems so much more difficult. The, peop- the happiest parents are parents who don't necessarily know where their kids are, but are confident that their kids are okay. And that, that if their kids do something stupid, some other parent is going to scold the kids and then call them and tell them what happened. Well, this is a really interesting point because one of the things that um, we've done, technology is always supposed to help us, but I find that there's a there's obviously a backside to it, and a lot of times it it diminishes aspects of our existence as well. So, for example, um, I don't know when the urban legend of the razor blade in the Halloween candy came out. <laughs> Uh, but the yeah. original one was an urban legend, and it became popular enough to where our hospitals would literally open up their x-ray machines for folks who wanted to x-ray their kids' candy. If you look at child abduction and Amber Alerts today, people are paranoid. My, my 10-year-old granddaughter was walking down the street, we quarter mile away. Uh, she likes to walk home. You know, my wife will pick her up and she'll drop her off at the beginning of our neighborhood so that she could walk home herself for the last last quarter mile or so. And a woman literally stopped her car. Honey, are you are you OK? Are you lost? You know, because a child walking by herself. Oh, my gosh, you must be abused. There's mm-hmm. an assumption that children are in inherent danger because the Internet has allowed these stories of kidnapped children to spread voraciously. And and my response yes. when I when I talked about this, I said two things. I said, first of all, you have to understand over like 96% of child abduction cases are custody battles. They're one parent who's taking the kid out of the country or out of the state from another parent. That's that's what most of those Amber Alerts are. Secondly, we live in a much safer time than we did even in the 70s, in the 80s, when we were walking home from school ourselves, because everybody has a video camera in their pocket today. We never had that. 
So if something happens where a van comes up and pulls a child, hey, you could pull a camera out of your pocket, take a picture of the license plate, take a video of the guy. Again, these incidents are so, so rare, but because of the ubiquity of their uh, being presented online, uh, so many people are so, so fearful. This, this safetyism has kind of taken place. And that's why I think a lot of people don't even want to trust the neighborhood with their kids. Uh, that's exactly right. And it's self-reinforcing. But the, the sort of modern media aspect you're talking about is important there, that there's a one in a million chance of this, of your child being abducted and harmed but if you see it in the news every time it happens there's some people who say there's almost a evolutionary psychology thing here mm -hmm. our brains believe that everything we hear about is happening in our immediate environment and so we assume it's happening every day because on the global level it is one kid is getting abducted every day in yeah. the western hemisphere and we assume or every week in the united states and so we assume that it's happening yeah, uh, that it's it's likely to happen to us. While things that are much more dangerous, like putting your kids in the car and driving them to Target, that car ride is more dangerous. I, you know, my wife yeah. and I are pretty. Chances uh, of an drowning. accident are higher. Yes. Yeah. So like drowning is a real danger for kids. Uh, abduction by strangers is not, and we have to sort of calibrate our you have good risk analysis. But uh, um, one thing my wife says sometimes. If I let the kids go off by themselves somewhere that she's a little apprehensive, she says, I'm not afraid of kidnappers. I'm afraid of CPS. Huh, of child that's right. Services. That's exactly right. That's and what I've heard. So, and that's one way it's self-reinforcing. And then fewer kids on the sidewalk makes it weirder for kids to be on the sidewalk, which makes other parents more afraid. And so it's self-reinforcing. Wow. And there are still a lot of neighborhoods around America where it's normal for the kids to run around. And uh, the people who live in those neighborhoods would never give that up because it's so valuable. Yeah. So let's let's talk about this uh, this future trajectory. We talked about the self reinforcing aspect of, of of being scared, but what's going to happen in a generation or two as the birth rate plummets, as our society grows older, as um, there are fewer and fewer. Uh, people earning money to create a tax base to even pay into the social security that you're going to want to draw. What 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 are the what are the bleak uh, prognoses that come out of this if we continue on the trajectory we're continuing today? So, first of all, if you see numbers saying the population will start shrinking in 2064, all of those are too rosy. They imagine a rebound in the birth rate in the United States, and there's no reason to think that that's going to happen. Um, and then immigration has helped us uh, fend off population decline to this right. point. But our three major sources of immigration, Mexico, India, and China, all three of those countries have birth rates that are below the replacement rate of 2.1 babies per woman. So unless something dramatic changes, and I'm hoping family unfriendly will cause a baby boom, but if that doesn't happen, we're going to have... Uh, the population of the United States be shrinking in our lifetimes, you know, 2050 or, or even earlier than that. But before then, we already have the hints of it right now. At this most recent census, 2020, there were fewer children in America than in the previous census, 2010. Not a smaller portion of the population, an actual lower number. Wow. And, and then you look at all sorts of places where the elementary schools are, are closing. So the baby bus started in 2008. It's now 15 years old. It's hit the high school age. Colleges are preparing for this. There were fewer babies born basically every year starting in 2008. And so there are fewer people under the age of 10 than there are in their 60s. So aging population, what does that mean? It, well, economically, it means in about 10 years, our workforce is gonna be shrinking dramatically just from the fact that millennials didn't have babies. And so our retirement age uh, population will be growing because the baby boomers, the largest generation ever, uh, will be retiring. And uh, lifespans, thankfully, are extending. So we will have lots of demand for services and goods, but not a lot of suppliers of services and goods. That, that number will be shrinking every year. Your retirement savings doesn't do you any good if there's nobody who can fix a leaky pipe when you call them. Mm. And so the, what we're, we're talking about at first is going to be massive inflation, waiting times, sort of desperation, and very bad conditions for people who can't pay 
the real high prices. So that's sort of the grim, <laughs> uh, if you have a really good retirement nest egg, the, the bad news is there might not be somebody on the other end of the phone when you make the call. And that's part of it, but that's just the economic level. I think there's something a lot darker. Places with less children are sadder. That's a lot of the social yeah. science that I pull. Places with less children are um, more likely to believe in zero sum reasoning. They're more likely to be uh, selfish, more likely to less likely to be outward facing and community facing. And this really is uh, where we're headed. And you see the first signs of it in Korea and Japan where they have so few babies and yet there's an explosion of the number of places that say no babies allowed. That's what's going really? on in Korea right now because there, people are just not getting used to seeing babies. And so that's why a falling birth rate is self-reinforcing. Once it gets below a certain level, fewer babies yields fewer babies, and that makes us sadder. And it's uh, children are a great thing that drag people back into the faith that they grew up in. We'll have less of that. I mean, usually people... Uh, try to end a, a discussion like this by asking for a positive thing, but you asked me for the grim story, so I just gave it to it. Unless we turn that birth rate around, it will be self-reinforcing, and it will be a sadder and poorer world. Wow. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I I, I would say, uh, and again, you you talk about kind of changing minds, changing hearts. Obviously, it's uh, it the faith community can be part of that. It's difficult as uh, the society, especially the younger generation, pulls away from traditional uh, faith institutions. Uh, they, they seem to uh, take a view uh, of faith like they've taken a view of everything else that, that it needs to shape and conform itself to my desires and my, my needs as opposed to I can conform myself to the desires and needs of the broader institution or the broader culture. Um, our cultural values, though, are also shifting, and, and obviously the, the, the single biggest transfer of moral understanding and cultural uh, awareness comes from teaching the next generation. And as we both uh, decrease that, because cultural institutions, and right, for example, uh, if there's the pressures that you're talking about, the financial, economic pressures, um, you know, are you going to choose to be a computer programmer or are you going to choose to be a musician? If there's, if there's uh, a wealth of computer programmers, you know, maybe you could be a musician. But as, as the number of positions opens up and the number of potential uh, employees declines, I think you're going to see what happens is you, you're, start, you're going to lose the arts in, in a much broader way. Uh, you're going to lose some of these other um, kind of a little bit more uh, austere positions for something that's a little bit more practical. And I think another aspect of this is that people are going to have to work longer. I, I don't think people are going to retire Absolutely. as early because they just have to fill the positions. So it, it's going to delay. No, that's exactly time. right. That, and again, you see how that's self-reinforcing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is a, there is a role that church can play in all this. And, and I, I think that would be an important thing to do. And I think um, uh, there's an aspect of just voicing how rewarding and how gratifying it is uh, it was interesting in these articles that I had uh, mentioned, um, one of the women said, you know, I've seen the TikToks of these friends of mine who have had families and have had kids and they're, they, they, they are all happy and things like that. And she goes, I, I think it's a little bit of a psyops, though. I think they're trying to just gaslight us a little bit, making it look, look like they're having a better time than they are. And I'm like, really? Do you really think that? Or is that just, again, a little bit of guilt? trying to be assuaged in your mind because, you know. It, well, the, the funniest guilt was in, I think in the Rachel Cohen article, she quoted somebody saying, I feel bad when I talk about how much I like my children yeah. because I feel like I'm violating, uh, I'm undermining feminist arguments. And at once I couldn't believe it, but I also instantly could believe it. <laughs> it made my jaw drop. Yeah, so 
anyway, it it there's there's so much more to be said as well. There's a lot of pieces here that uh, we've not talked about. There's uh, the technological push for de even divorcing pregnancy from biology, artificial wombs and, and things like that that futurists are going to. But but we'll leave those for another conversation. Um, I I am really looking forward to the book, Tim. I'm uh, glad that you are here today. There's there's a lot of things here. One of the more interesting things going back to the theology is I find it fascinating that the one of the primary ways God explains our relationship with him is through the model of the family. He calls himself the father. We are his children. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn so much as a parent about forgiveness because you love your kids, even though they're completely, they can do something that's just completely wrong and nasty. And, but you, would, you understand the, the balance between evil and love and how those two things can coexist. You understand your own frailty. You understand your own imperfection because as a parent, you never get things right. All of these things come together. And so I think that this, this uh, is also, there's also a spiritual warfare element in this that maybe we don't ever talk about uh, because it really does undermine concepts of who God is. And uh, if we don't have that point of reference, uh, then God becomes even more and more obtuse. Uh, there's a, a, a great a book out called The Faith of the Fatherless that uh, outlines kind of many of the famous atheists over the years and how they were all had conflicts with their fathers. And what they did was they projected that that aspect of, of the mean father onto God. And they so they would see God as as kind of the imperfect, cruel father that they'd had growing up. And that actually led uh, in some ways contributed, I should say, to their lack of belief. So all of that comes together as well. It's, it's pretty an interesting uh, story. Uh, any closing comments or things that you'd like uh, to leave our viewers with? No, I, just to go further down uh, that, uh, that line the other day, um, I was at a church where the painting behind the altar is uh, a manger scene. It was Mary holding the baby Jesus and Joseph looking over Mary's shoulder. And I was just thinking, <laughs> this is the, you know, this is a pinnacle moment. We say the most important decision a person mm -hmm. ever made was Mary saying yes. Um, and then in uh, Judaism too, what's promised to Abraham at the sort of founding moment of that is his progeny. And so it's, it's one of these things that it tells us something about us that instantly makes sense, but maybe we didn't think of, but that our relationship with God is directly illustrated with our relationship with our parents and our, um, for those of us who are lucky to be parents, our being parents and uh, a, a world in which that's just a, a choice that some people make because it fits their lifestyle is a world in which so much of our nature is abstracted away from us and it's harder for us to know who we are and thus impossible for us to be happy. And so parenting for me, you know, with six kids, there are many moments that are not happy. Cleaning up vomit or, or you know, if you get lied to by a child or, or something like that. But ultimately, it's something that educates us as to who we are, our relationship with our brother, with, you know, fellow man and with God. And it's uh, uh, it's an education that all of us probably need in order to live a happy and fulfilling life. I, I completely agree. So that's again, this is why it's such an important aspect. The book is Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be by Timothy P. Carney. You can pre-order it on Amazon.com and I'll put the link down at, uh, below the video. Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I'm really interested in, in reading the book when it comes out. I hope things uh, uh, go well. And uh, we will talk again, I'm sure.